Last week, we started a three-part series on curiosity. And we want to continue it this week. The first, let's see if I can, the first week we talked about deception. And this week we're going to talk about depression. Next week it's delight. So sometimes we wonder why, how curiosity we can see how curiosity leads to deception. We can see how curiosity leads to delight. But what about depression? Because depression is handled differently than most subjects in the Bible. Last week we saw a lot of scriptures with the word deceit or deception in it. Next week we're going to see a lot of scriptures with the word delight and uh, purpose and peace and and these types of uh, um, the words. But yet, in most versions of the Bible, we don't find the word depressed. We don't find the words interpreted depressed. But yet, the Bible is full of depressed people. And I look around and I see that nearly every family in here, at one time or another, has gone through periods where depression could overtake their lives. And so we want to begin. Now, we may be a little long today, so I'm not going to be looking up the scriptures. You've got in the handouts all the scriptures. I'm just going to be reading them off of my sheet. That will save us a minute or two for me fumbling through the book. We want to again begin in Ecclesiastes 1, in verse... 8 and then verses 13 through 15. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, And behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. In verse 13, he basically says that we are all born curious. And Solomon decided to satisfy his curiosity by learning everything about everything. There wasn't going to be anything he didn't research. He had a thousand, he had 700, three, uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines, or the other way around. Anyway, he had a thousand women in his entourage, his harem, whatever. I imagine that whatever the most popular drugs were at that time, he probably found out what those were like too. And he found out what war was like a little bit. And he found out what riding a a racing chariot was like. And he studied science because he was just, he had an insatiable curiosity to find out everything. And when he did, it was the most depressing thing that ever happened to him. And he says, whoa, this is worthless. What's it gained me? All this curiosity, all this searching for wisdom, all this searching for knowledge. What's it gained me? And he fell into a funk. That's an old time word for you young people. Okay, he fell into a funk. Ah, man. And he got depressed. We get depressed. The greatest, the wisest, richest man that ever lived got depressed. So don't think you're exempt. If you've ever never been depressed, then you have been of all creatures most blessed. There are many reasons for depression. Curiosity being maybe a remote one. 
So we want to look at a few today of causes, of reasons, of why we get depressed. We want to spend some time then recognizing depression, looking at a role model of someone who was able to not succumb to depression, and then how we overcome it. In Genesis 37, verses 29 to 36, we find of a man who had everything in the world going for him, and then a tragedy struck. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the varicota tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it's your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put his sackcloth, put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And, and he said, Surely I will go to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. So more than Jacob, we focus on, but we also look at Reuben. Reuben was the oldest son. Reuben was supposed to be the one who inherited from Jacob. He was going to get the blessing. He was going to get 50% of everything Jacob owned. But Jacob had taken the symbol of the, the heir, which was this coat, and gave it to his youngest son instead of his oldest son. So you can see where Reuben was having some trouble too. And now Reuben was also responsible for his other brothers, and he was responsible for Joseph. And remember, he, had he was going to try to wiggle out a way to find out how not to kill him. Him and Judah were decided of the, nine, of the, of the ten that those two decided they really didn't want to kill Joseph. The other eight was re were ready to kill him. So Reuben had to be faced with, what am I to do? Where am I to go? I can't go back home and tell Dad we lost his son. So they concocted the idea of taking, killing a, a, a goat, smearing his tunic in it, and, and deceiving their father. And it worked. And his father was depressed. And his father stayed depressed. Now, there was a period of time that you mourned for a family member. You were expected to do what he did. You kind of symbolically rip your garment. You sit in sa uh, ashes. And people come up and they feel sorry for you and they pat you on the head. And, and they just feel and cry with you and, and do all this. We have our own mourning practices here in, this, in, our, in our society. This was the way they did their mourning. But it was expected at the end of that period of time which could be at 30 days, that the person mourning would get up, get dressed, and then go and continue living. Jacob's depression was so strong and so heavy that he couldn't. And he mourned for, for Joseph until he was reunited with him 20 years later. The depression also affected the rest of that family. If you, when you read through it and you can see when and uh, when they come to uh, when they come to Egypt, uh, as it, as many years later, 17 years later, they they find out about this. Or 23 years later, they find out about uh, what's going on, and uh, it shows you some of their how they were living. So death of a loved one can put us into depression, a depressed state. Another cause for depression is a threat to your security. In Joshua 2, verses 1 through 11, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, 
Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in, the order, in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and when you did to the, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. An entire city was depressed. They lived in this fear. They lived in a constant state of worry. And again, I, I, when I read these stories, I just want to spend the time telling you the entire story of Rahab. Because apparently these, they didn't really believe her when she said she'd send them away. But she had to hide them inside the flax because she knew they would probably search her house. So they probably searched her house. They didn't find them because they were inside this flax, these stalks of, up on the roof. And so she was able to send them away. And it breeds a lot of other questions too. Like, did God sanction this lie? Did God sanction this deception? Just an interesting side point that when we, when you read a passage from the scriptures, there are so many stories in it that we can't cover them all in one lesson. Like, who was Rahab? Do you realize that she was one of the two foreign women in the lineage of Jesus? We'll look at the other one later on. But this whole, so a threat to your security, a fear, will lead us and can lead us into depression. Now, there are a lot of other examples of of this fear. One was Ruth, who was the other woman in the lineage of Jesus, who was a foreigner. She was a Moabitess. Her husband died. She could stay in the country where she was, go back to her family and the family which was. But she says, no. Naomi, I'm, your God is my God. Your country is my country. I'm going back with you. So they go back to Israel. Now, Naomi is not a widow by law. She does not, her husband died. Um, Ruth's husband died. But neither of them are widows. Naomi's protected by another law of the Jews because she had male relatives. And the male relatives then were obligated to take care of her. So she had a place to live. She had something to eat. She had clothes. She had people. Ruth didn't qualify. She wasn't eligible because she was a foreigner. She didn't have family there. There was no one obligated to take care of Ruth. It was pretty depressing. A single woman, foreign country, no way to make a living, what do you do? Well, we know what Ruth and Naomi, what Naomi actually said, Ruth, my family's going to help you out for a little bit. You got to get out and start doing something. So go to the fields and glean. At least you're providing food. Okay, so we know what gleaning is. And of course, then we know that Some guy saw her and got attracted to her and the whole story of Ruth. But it was depressing. Here she'd given up her family, her life, her country, come to another one, and now she's faced with starvation. She had no job. She had no money. 
She's in poverty. Poverty can lead us into depression. It can keep us there. There's another guy that got depressed. He was, he's the emotional depression. He's a great example of the pouter. Of the one who just, if I can't get my way. Okay. His name was Ahab. He was a king. He saw this vineyard he wanted. Ah, man, it's the perfect, it's the most, the best grapes that ever been made on earth, that ever been grown. But this silly guy that owns it won't sell it to me. He gets so mad. He runs into his bedchamber, plops himself down on his bed, and tries to and won't see anybody, won't talk to anybody. He's in, he's, man, he's throwing a fit. He's depressed. And then his loving, caring wife, Jezebel, comes in and finds a solution for him. So that wasn't a very nice example, but it was an example of depression, of how when you don't get what you want, can put you into a depressed state. I want the new car, I want the new house, I want the new clothes, I want the new ring, I want, I want, I want. <clears throat> so you just borrow yourself down into a, a fit of depression. Now we want to spend a few minutes with the man that we give credit for patience and we use quite often for depression. And that's Job. And we're going to look at two full chapters of Job because we want to look at Job in two ways. One is his claim and one is his justification. So we want to read chapters 3 and chapters 31 out of the book of Job. I'm going to tell you something else too about when we're fighting with depression and I dare say many of us in here are, either have been, are, or soon will be, or think we're over it, and maybe we are over it. The most curative power and medicine you can take is God's Word. We can't read enough. That's why we're going to spend so much time reading God's Word today, because that's where the power is for us to overcome this depression. After, afterward, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, That the day perish on which I was to be born, and the night which said, A boy is conceived. May that day be darkness. Let not God above care for it, nor let light shine on it. Let darkness and black gloom claim it. Let a cloud settle on it. Let the blackness of the day ter terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful shout enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are prepared to rouse Leviathan. Let the stars of its twilight be darkened. Let it wait for light, but have none. And let it not see the breaking dawn, because it did not shut the opening of my mother's womb or hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me, and why the breast that I should suck? For now I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept then, I would have been at rest. With kings and with counselors of the earth who rebuild ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who were filling their houses with silver, or like a miscarriage which is discarded, I would not be as infants that never saw light. There the wicked cease from raging, and there the weary are at rest. The prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Why is light given to him who suffers, and life to the bitter soul, who, who long for death, but there is none, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice greatly and exult when they find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? For my groaning comes at the sight of my food, and my cries pour out like water. For what I fear comes upon me, 
And what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet, and I am not at rest, but turmoil comes. This is a man severely depressed. He regrets the day that he was born. And again, many lessons we can get, many side stories we can, that are in this chapter. But the emphasis is on the fact that the man just had given up. He'd given up. I'd just as soon be dead. Food doesn't taste good to me. People talking to me don't encourage me. Music doesn't pick me up. I just don't care. Wish I were dead. That's where Job was. That's where some of us have found ourselves. But then Job starts thinking, you know, this ain't my fault. This shouldn't have ever happened to me. I'm still going to be depressed, but I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to express it in a different way. And he does that in Job 31. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? And what is the portion of God from above or the heritage of the Almighty from on high? Is it not calamity to the unjust and disaster to those who work iniquity? Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened after deceit, let him weigh me with accurate scales and let my God know my integrity. If my step is turned from the way, or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot is stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat, and let my crops be uprooted. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or I have lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind for another, and let others kneel down over her, for that would be a lustful crime. Moreover, it would be an iniquity punishable by judges, for it would be fire that consumes to Abaddon, and would uproot all my increase." If I have despised the claim of my male or female slaves where they filed a complaint against me, what then could I do when God arises? And when he calls me to account, what will I answer him? Did not he make me in the womb? Did not he who made me in the womb make him in the same one fashion us in the womb? If I have kept the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or have eaten more, my morsel alone and the orphan has not shared it, but from my youth he grew up with me as it was my father, and from infancy I guided her. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or that the needy had no covering, if his loins have not thanked me, and if he has not been warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the orphan, because I saw I had support in the gate, let my shoulder fall from the socket, and my arm be broken off at the elbow, for calamity from God is a terror to me, and because of his majesty I can do nothing." If I have put my confidence in gold and called the fine gold my trust, if I have gloated because my wealth was great and because my hand had secured so much, if I have looked on the sun when it shone or the moon going in, going in splendor and my heart became secretly enticed and my hand threw a kiss from my mouth, that too would have been an iniquity calling for judgment, for I would have denied God above. Have I rejoiced at the extension of my enemy or exalted when evil befell him? No, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life and a curse. Have the men of my tent not said, who can find one who has not been satisfied with his meat? The alien has not lodged outside, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. Have I covered my transgressions like Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom because I feared the great multitude? And the contempt of families terrified me and kept silent and did not go out of doors, or that I had one to hear me. Behold, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. And the indictment which my adversary has written, surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it to myself like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. If my land cries out against me and its furrows weep deep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money, or have caused the, its owners to lose their lives, let briars grow instead of wheat and stink weed instead of barley, the words of Job are ended. Job got to the point in his depression where he said, you know, 
I haven't done anything to deserve this. And let me tell you how the great... Have I ever cheated anybody? Have I ever overlooked anybody? I treat the homeless and the orphans like they were my own kids. As if I'd grown up with them and they've been lifelong friends. That's how I see the stranger. If I've cheated anybody out of... If I I have... Um, lusted for gold or for another woman then surely I should be punished in our depression sometimes we blame ourselves to where we're ready to die and then we're ready to die again because we blame somebody else And God challenged, and Job challenges God. And have you ever done that in your depression? Well, you've challenged God? Why? Lord, you tell me why this is happening. Why am I in this state? I have. I've challenged God. But just like Job... We have to be ready when God answers. So that's depression. Those are examples. of How do you recognize it? I've got a personal confession. Take a couple minutes. I used to tell people I was born to fail. I was raised to fail. And I take that because my mom was, I think, well-intentioned. I think my mom loved, I know my mom loved me. But my mama used to sit down from the time I can remember and go over the house budget, household budget. I might have been eight, ten years old. I don't think I was any younger than that when she started. But this lasted until I left home. And she'd go down and show where we didn't have any money this month. Where we couldn't buy this, we couldn't buy that. And it was because my dad did stupid things. He did foolish things. He would join this club, or he'd do this, or he'd buy this project, or he'd do this. And so she was showing me how my dad failed. Now, I don't think she realized to the extent that she was doing it, because that said to me, because I'm like my dad, I'm going to be a failure. I'm going to be a poor failure all my life. And I really have struggled today believing that anything I do is good or successful. That people say, oh, that's nice, Al, just because that's what they say to everybody about everything. That it's not really serious. That it really wasn't that good. I fight with that. And that has put me into a lifetime of depression that I didn't even know I had. And I knew at different times in my life when different things happened that I was depressed. But there was that underlying life of depression that was always there. That kept that failure up front. Didn't allow me to see past it. Didn't allow me to enjoy the successes that God was giving me. Because in my back of my mind, it was always, it was not enough or it really wasn't true, it really wasn't, and uh, well, who do you think you are? All these things. And it wasn't until a few weeks ago, maybe it's a month or two now, that God opened my eyes. That's how I can prepare this lesson today. That's how I can tell you that, it, that this lesson will work. Because that burden was lifted. I still had to fight with it. Man, for that first week or two, it was euphoria, walking on water, walking on air, settling in. But God's given me the tool now to see when Satan starts nibbling away. When that evil spirit tries to make its house again in my brain. Because God gave me the power to sweep out and get rid of that evil spirit. 
But I always have to be on guard because the devil is right there waiting to jump right back in. Every time I get discouraged, every time something doesn't go right, every time something happens, the devil is right there to jump right back in. And I have to be ready to kick him right back out. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 4, For whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. If you've been in a stage in your life when there is no hope, Ecclesiastes, which is the man who kind of defined depression, says there's hope. So even when he got to his lowest point, Solomon still knew that there was some hope. So for you and for me, there is hope. We can intellectually understand that, but that doesn't mean emotionally and spiritually we accept that. But in Psalm 143, verses 1 through 4, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. And do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no man living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart is appalled within me. Something's wrong with me, Lord. I don't see joy. I don't see bright colors. I see grays. I see dinginess. Nothing really excites me. There's a problem, Lord. That's what he's telling us here in Psalms. If those define you, if you find yourself in that spirit mode, you're depressed. You recognize it. And when you recognize it, the first thing you need to do is go to God and cry for help. And then he says on in verse Psalm 142, I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from the persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Job, when he hit the bottom, said, God, you better answer me. David, when he hit the bottom, said, Lord, I deserve it. Whatever it is, but I know you can deliver me. Start lifting me up. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to recognize our situation and to cry out to him and say, deliver me, lift me up. And how is he going to do that? He's going to do it because you're going to thank him for all the great things he does for you. You start listing them one by one. See how long it takes. Of all the blessings that you receive daily. Or bi-weekly or monthly, whenever your paycheck comes, if you have a paycheck. Or as long as you have a paycheck. Thank him for the blessings. And then he says, surround me with people who love you. Many people, when they get depressed, many people, Christians, when they get to, one of the first things they do is stop coming to church. And one of the greatest ways of overcoming depression is to be among fellow Christians. It is Satan at work in you when you decide to skip church because you're not feeling well or you, something's upset you. That's Satan at work. 
because he knows if you come in the midst of fellow Christians and sing songs and worship and praise him, he's going to lift, God's going to lift that burden from you. So don't let Satan beguile you, deceive you by saying those hypocrites down at church aren't going to help me. I don't get any, I'm not getting anything out of it. The old adage is you get out of it what you put into it. If you bring your brokenness to the Lord, he will send you away healed. That's your choice. But you know, maybe Brian's never been depressed in Danny's life. <laughs> Walks of water. <laughs> Nothing's going to bother me. No matter what you do to me, you're not going to take me down. No way, no way. Well, that probably isn't true with Brian. It probably isn't true with any of us here, but it was true with one man. One man who had two earthly parents. His name was Joseph. And we just looked at Joseph and his dad and his brothers. Now let's go over to Genesis 45. And let's look at how Joseph handled being rejected by his brothers thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, bought by a man, had his wife accused him of a sexual assault, had the, had the slave owner's wife accused him of sexual assault, being thrown into prison, languishing in prison, having a promise from a guy that he would tell the Pharaoh of how great things he's done to get him free, and being forgotten by those people. And he spends 20 years... From the time he's thrown into that pit until he gets to go meet Pharaoh, it's 20 years. Ample time to get depressed. Ample time to feel bad. Ample time to blame his brothers. Ample time to blame God. Ample time to blame Potiphar's wife. Ample time to blame Potiphar. Ample time to blame the, sh the, 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 the cupbearer. Ample time. But let's read what Joseph says. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler of all the land of Egypt. I couldn't be a Joseph. When I, I can look back on my life and be a Joseph. But during the things when they were happening, I wasn't a Joseph. Joseph believed when his brothers threw him in that pit, God had something better in mind. When they sold him into slavery, God had something better in mind. When Potiphar's wife accused him of sexual assault, he had something better in mind. When the, the cupbearer forgot, forgot about him, God had something better in mind. God gave us his example to encourage us that sometimes bad things happen and we have the opportunity to make good out of them. Joseph's patience, Joseph's faith, and his willingness to just accept what happens to him created the nation of Israel. So God gives us these examples of failure, but he always gives us examples of success. Now, how do we overcome it? How are you going to overcome depression? In Joshua, we go back how interesting it is we sometimes go back 
to stories of getting into depression to that same story getting us out of depression. In Joshua 2, verses 12 through 14, Rahab speaking, says, Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth, and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. This whole city was depressed. Rahab and her family depressed. She decided to do something about it. And what she did was very risky. Risky in hiding the spies because if the men of the city would have caught her, they would have killed her. Now she has to make another risk that these men are actually going to keep their promise. She had no guarantee that they would keep her promise except their word. And these were foreign people. <laughs> so we have to realize to overcome this depression, one, we're going to have to have faith, and one, it's going to have to take some stepping out maybe taking some risk, but definitely having faith. So we had to search ourselves if we have that faith and prepare ourselves and gird with it. And then the next thing, which is always the worst thing for all of us, especially if you're a kid at Christmas or at birthday. Because in Psalm 27, 14, he says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Job had to wait for the Lord. He had to endure his friends. He had to endure the pain. He had to endure the suffering. Whatever you're going through now, God says don't do something rash. Don't do something just to do something. But just wait. I'll give you the right, I'll tell you what to do. You'll know when it's the right time to do something. Okay, just wait for me. He continues that in Isaiah 40, verse 31, where he says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will not walk and not become weary. If you've been through a, a period of depression, it's hard to imagine soaring on wings like eagles, running and not getting tired, because I'm always tired. I never have energy. How can I walk and not be weary? God says, when you wait on me, build your faith, you're going to be able to run and not get tired. He continues on in verse, Psalm 143. Uh, no, he's not. It's Psalm 143, verses 5 through 12. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I muse on the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you, my soul longs for you as a parched land. Selah. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will become like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I take refuge in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your loving kindness, cut off my enemies. And destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. My soul longs for you. Now I want you to notice something, because it's not contradicting. He says, answer me quickly, Lord. Now, what is the answer that, that David's asking for in this psalm? Is it deliverance from what got him depressed? Or is it that he's asking more for God's presence? He says, let me hear your loving kindness in the morning. Let me build my trust in you. Teach me. Teach me indicates a period of time. 
teaching isn't instantaneous. Teaching isn't removing whatever it is tomorrow. We have to realize that God will take us and deliver us from this depression. That he guarantees he'll do it. But that he wants us to enter this dialogue with him. So that we don't stop, we don't give up. We prepare ourselves for when that depression is going to be lifted. Because just like I said, once, we, that, once that evil spirit's gone, he's going to come back. And remember the parable of Jesus with the guy who he, the spirit left? And the guy cleaned up his house, right? He got everything in order, cleaned up, got a job, got doing this, taking care of all the business, yeah, everything's going fine, everything's going great. But he never brought God back into his life and said that spirit came back with seven buddies and the guy was in worse shape than he was before he ever kicked the spirit out. You've got to be ready to kick the spirit out that's evil, but you have to replace it with Jesus, with God. In verse Psalm 147, through 1 through 3, we find another way. It goes against what I was talking about with this one guy this morning, because he said, we don't do singing in church. And I go to Psalm 147, 3, he says, praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and praise is becoming. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Music. They, there's a saying, right? Music calms the savage beast. I don't know of anyone who hasn't used music for healing of one sort or another. You get mad, you get upset, you're furious, and then one of these songs comes on the radio, or you start remembering, or, or God will put that song in your head, and you don't turn on the radio, turn on the Caleb, turn on the family radio, turn on, turn on the CD, turn on the, play the video, MP3, whatever it is, Soothe, music has a way of soothing us, of calming us. Now, some of the music is used for to getting us all riled up, okay? Because it's okay, and so maybe that's what we need. But sometimes we need, you know, Bach or Beethoven, and other times we might need whoever the rock groups are today. Okay, we may need those guys. We may need Alice Cooper if you know him. Okay. Because actually, I like the Alex Cooper. But anyway, um, so he says, don't forget music. Sometimes that's the starting point to help us relax, to help us calm down, and then be ready to, to do that dialogue with God. And then Job 42, because remember in Job 31, he decides to call out God. God answered him, and after God answered him, here is Joseph's response. Then Job, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I do not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the year, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. When we call out God and we challenge God and he answers us, we have nothing left to do but say, oh, you're right. Repent. But recognize who God is. Recognize his role. Accept your own limitations. Accept the losses that you've, that you've had to have. And then let God take care of the rest. So you must recognize your, 
your situation, you need to confess that you need his help, then you need to be determined to follow him. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might lead me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You must realize you are weak. That your strength comes from God. And that when you do, he will elevate you. He will raise you. He will take what's weak in you and use it for strength. I can testify that in many areas of my own life. But we want to close with one more passage. That's 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strength, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. We need to be humble. We need to realize that none of this suffering, none of this pain, none of this depression is permanent. And our suffering is only temporary as long as we make it. As long as we indulge it, we will suffer. We will be depressed. It is when we take these steps that we've just to overcome it. God will free us. And we will no longer be under the yoke of depression. It works. God's proven it. He'll prove it to you if you are. Remember, you don't have to do it alone. Remember the one passage where he says, bring me people. Put people around me. It may be be a professional counselor. It may be a friend. But don't let Satan continue to control your life and keep you in that state when God's waiting to free you. Let's pray, and then the team will come up. Father in heaven, I uh, thank you for the, the people's patience with me today and for allowing me to share Uh, your word with them to encourage each of us uh, to realize that depression and father is can be something small like it was with Ahab or something great like it was with Job and father I just pray that uh, for each of us here that you will give us a free spirit that will we look for you to the answers for everything in our lives and that we will get courage encouragement from one another And as we stand and sing this song, Father, we pray that um, you will free our hearts. And if anyone needs to share uh, anything with the group, that they'll respond. For this we pray in Jesus. Amen.